card. Right, okay. Thank you for joining us today. I am very excited to have my good friend and pretty much daily, daily DMer, <laughs> him, we chat most days, um, to speak to you today about overcoming your the three most common mistakes to building a better body over 40. But essentially what Kim and I want to do today is just give you some real valid information because you know what it's like at this time of the year. We're just inundated with stuff and it's overwhelming. <laughs> um, and a lot of it isn't valid to this population. And Kim and I are menopausal women. We've been there, we've done that, we've bought the t-shirt and we can give you some really valid information. So the purpose of the talk today is at the end of this, you know more than when you came in. And that's hopefully what you will feel at the end of this. This is a presentation based um, live today. So Kim will be doing most of the talking and sharing some screens, we'll chat in between. And so hopefully you'll You'll feel sort of like that you get value for this afterwards. Um, I'm literally going to be looking at your comments. And my friend Lorna, hi Lorna. <laughs> um, I'm going to be looking at the comments and either responding or we'll talk at the end. Hopefully we'll have time for a Q&A. Also want you to know at the end of this, you will have the opportunity to hear about a program that Kim is doing. Um, so that's up to you at the end. And um, she will let you know more about that. We'll post a link. But for the meantime, if you just want to have some valid information, we're going to get started. So welcome, Kim. Thank you for doing this today. I very much appreciate you coming into the group and doing this. You got it. Let me share my screen. Make sure I pick the right one. That's the one. Okay. All right, ladies, I'm so glad you could join us here today. I've been a member of this group for a good long time now, and there are many conversations that come up about weight loss all the time. Sometimes I try and jump in and help. Um, the problem with weight loss and specifically with weight loss over 40, but weight loss generally is there is so much misinformation that has been repeated over and over again, that it becomes accepted as just fact. And then it's passed from person to person. And so it can get really challenging to pick apart, like, how do I actually do this? Like, what is evidence-based and what has just been like telephone, uh, whisper down the lane, not truth. So what we're going to talk about today are the three most common mistakes women over 40 make trying to get into shape. And most importantly, how you can overcome those things. All right. By the end of this class, you're going to know three simple changes you can make to get in your best shape yet. Now, maybe this is you, maybe you're somebody who yo-yo dieted your entire life, as long as you can remember, and you're looking for a permanent solution. You want to stop thinking about your weight. You want to stop thinking about food all the time. This was me. I was a yo-yo dieter for a very long time, or maybe that's not you at all. Maybe you never struggled with your weight until you hit 40. And now you just want to feel confident in your skin again. Or maybe this is you, you want to age well, you've seen your family, you've seen your friends, you've seen them struggle with their health in their later years, and you want to be strong and healthy then, and so you want to get strong and healthy now. Drop in the comments and give me a one, two, or three. Amanda, you're going to have to tell me since I'm not filled in the comments on this one. Which one are you? Which one resonates with you most? Are you ready for a permanent solution? Want to stop yo-yo dieting? You want to feel confident in your skin again? Give me a two and three if you're interested in aging well. What do we see in there, Amanda? Okay, well, I'll answer this question first until um, the, the, there's a slight lag with Facebook. I think that possibly I've been number one in the past. I don't think I've struggled with confidence issues, but I completely understand them, but I'm definitely a number three right now. And we have them all coming in now. So there's lots of ones, twos and threes. Oh, actually it's quite interesting. So we've got a little bit of everything happening here. Bonjour from Paris. Oh, Perry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, and that's one, two, typical. one, two, one, two, three. So I think there's yeah. like a bit of a combination of everything. Yeah. These are the three things that I hear most often from women, sometimes more than one of these. This is typically what I hear from women in our age group. And whichever of these is you, I fully support you. And those are all valid things. 
Now, I do want to take just two minutes and introduce myself to you in case we haven't met yet. Over here on the left, you can see my family. My husband, Brian, and I have three not so little babies anymore. And our new little fur baby, uh, she's not new anymore. She's going to be one next week. That's Lily May. And as you can see from our Christmas sweatshirts, uh, we are slightly obsessed with our puppy. <laughs> this is me over here on the right. I started powerlifting at 45, and I really like the feeling of being strong. I did not come to fitness early in life like many people do. I did struggle with my weight. As a teenager, I started yo-yo dieting. All through my 20s was looking to like lose the last five pounds. And then by the time I hit my 30s and started having my children, I gained 50 pounds with each of my pregnancies. And I never fully lost that 50 pounds before I got pregnant again. And so by the time I was 38, I was struggling with obesity. I was overwhelmed with that situation. And I was really low on hope. I turned it all around in my early 40s when I figured out how to manage my nutrition. And I started progressive strength training for the first time. But what I really want you to know is I didn't just make this transformation for myself. I've helped hundreds and hundreds of women over 40 lose weight and get in the best shape of their life. You can lose weight after 40. You can feel stress-free around food and the scale. If that's something you want, I absolutely want to help you do that. When it comes to losing weight and feeling your best after 40, I know it works and I know what doesn't. Can we just go back to that last slide and just talk about that last point? Because this is something I hear all the time and I think it's a super important message. There's yeah. so many diets out there that literally prey on the fact that you're going to feel guilty if you eat something they tell you not to eat and it does yeah. promote anxiety and that eventually ends you to be rebounding and um, regressing. And so the whole point of this presentation is to give you the information to allow you to sort of like feel that ease around food because it's so common yes. at this age. Yeah. Absolutely. There's a lot of fear mongering when it comes to food. And there's a lot of pressure we put on ourselves to be perfect once we decide like, okay, I'm going to lose weight or I'm going to build muscle or whatever it is. And getting to a point and it takes practice um, the way you speak to yourself, the way you interact with food, the way you talk to others about food and your diet, you know, instead of talking about like, oh, I'm on a diet, I can't have that, you know, talking more along the lines of like, you know what, I'm choosing not to have pizza tonight because I'm having ice cream later, right? There's all kinds of nutritional compromises you can make and how you speak about those things can really impact how you feel about food and about your body. And so absolutely, I am all about making this as guilt-free and stress-free and anxiety-free as possible. All right, I want you to just for a minute, imagine what it would be like to wake up and be relaxed about the number on the scale, like not even thinking about the number on the scale, to not be thinking and stressing about your food all the time and to be able to wear anything in your closet. Losing weight after 40 is simpler than it's made out to be. It is not easy, but it's simple and it doesn't have to be painful or restrictive. If you're anything like me, you like to know what you're doing at all times. So I'm going to tell you real fast what we're going to be talking about here today. We're going to talk first about the number one belief keeping you stuck. Then I'm going to talk about why carbs don't have to be so scary. Then we're going to talk about the role of cardio in over 40 fat loss. And then we're gonna have time for some questions. So any questions you have, pop them in the chat and we'll, we're gonna try and get to as many as we can. All right, so let's talk about mistake number one. Your belief that age or your hormones are keeping you from losing weight is keeping you from losing weight. The average weight gain during the perimenopause transition is five pounds. And I'm sure a lot of you are like, woo, I'm an, I'm an overachiever. I've weigh more than five pounds. There is nothing to support the idea that perimenopause is causing the weight gain. And that's a really important point. As well, we have new research that indicates that the age-related slowing of metabolism is not what conventional wisdom assumed it was. For, me, for as long as I can remember, we've all talked about the idea that our metabolism slows as we age. Just this past summer, some new research came out. Uh, a scientist by the name of Herman Ponser published this research in August of 2021. He measured energy expenditure across the lifespan. He used a large database. There were over 6,000 people, and they ranged in age from eight days old to 95 years old. You can see this here on this graph over here. Uh, across the bottom axis, you can see from zero to all the way from eight days, all the way up to 95, okay? And then here on this side, 
This axis, that's total energy expenditure. So your metabolism. And watch what happens. We start here with the, with the eight day old infant and all the way up here till 20 years old. You can see that total daily energy expenditure. It's going up and up and up. And then here's where it gets really interesting. From age 20 all the way over, keep looking how far it goes, all the way over to age 60, it remained stable. It wasn't until age 60 that they started seeing this decline. Okay, this is this is news to us, right, Amanda? We've all talked about how there's this small decline in our metabolism. And what the research is showing now is that's not actually the case. And I Thoughts think on that, that, Amanda? Yeah, and I think that people may look at this and go, that's not right. That can't be true. But I would argue that this is great news. This is great news because if your metabolism isn't broken, because that's typically the message that we'll, we'll hear, then that means you have so much more control over what's happening. Because if you've got a broken metabolism, then I'm afraid we can't do much to help you. Um, yeah. but, but the idea that you know our metabolism stays stable um, and, and we have so much we can do to support our metabolism through food and exercise, then the ball is now in our court and that's power. So seriously, this is good news. It is good news. And I know a lot of people were frustrated when this research was published in August and everyone was talking about it. I had a lot of frustrated, frustrated women in my DMs and my comment section. They're like, that just can't be right. And I was saying the same thing you just were, Amanda. This is actually really good news for us. It's also important to note so much scientific research is done on men. And then we kind of have to extrapolate those results to women. This study did include women. So, you know, menopausal women were here, ladies. Okay, so let's talk about our hormones now. The decline in estrogen in perimenopause can cause a shift in where you tend to store excess body fat. That is a real thing you're noticing. If you're noticing there's all of a sudden more fat in your belly region, that it, it's a real thing. You're not imagining that. The important point here though is perimenopause and that decline in estrogen is not causing excess fat loss. It is causing a shift in where you store excess fat. Those are two really different things, okay? So this decline in your estrogen is not causing you to hold on to fat or not be able to release the fat. What it's changing is where that fat might be on your body. And then very important is this. You lose that fat on your belly the exact same way that you lose fat anywhere else. There is no special menopause belly fat loss protocol. Stop. And if someone is, are you saying there's no such thing as spot reduction? <laughs> there's no such thing as spot reduction. I know we want, I look, I wish there were too. It'd be great if we could be like, I want to lose it right here or right there. It's just not a thing. And so if somebody is trying to sell you a menopause belly fat loss reduction protocol or a middle age belly fat uh, workout or something like this, it's either just marketing lingo. They don't know what they're talking about, or they're just trying to get your money. It, it literally doesn't exist. Amanda, you posted something this morning and I really only saw it for a quick second. I didn't get to read the post. Um, you were quoting Jen Gunter yes. talking yes, it, about- it essentially just said that um, the misconception that we are less in menopause has to go. We aren't less. And I think that that's the way we go in to menopause with a mindset that we've lost something, that we've lost control, we've lost our hormones, we've lost our mind, it's the idea of loss. And, and really we need to flip that narrative. And essentially that, that was what the post was about. And, well, and I liked the, it was important wording. And Jen always comes up with these important wordings and I try and remind myself and I saw that and I actually quick checked my slide here to make sure I hadn't worded it in the way she was like, we shouldn't be talking about it in this way. And I had it, but she was saying, we shouldn't be talking about it in the way of that we're losing estrogen. We're not losing it just like, how did you, you put it? We're not losing childhood as we grow into being an adult, right? It's just a different stage of life, of life. We're not losing estrogen. We're supposed to have less at this time of life. So I think that's an important um, distinction. Yes, it is. It was really great. And, and that doesn't dismiss the fact that women struggle. We have symptoms, our quality of life changes, and you can get help during that time. That's not what this message was saying. This message was saying the mind shift we need to take of that we're going into menopause. And that's a good thing. It's yeah. meant to happen. Stop trying to fight biology. Yes. Okay. So what does all of this mean for you that we've talked about so far? You can check hormones and age-related slowing of metabolism off the list of reasons you're gaining weight or are unable to lose weight. And as Amanda said, this is good 
news. There's nothing mysterious or out of your control keeping you from losing weight. Good news, ladies. Okay, here's what else it means. If you do these things, you can and will be successful at weight loss after 40. Number one, always and forever, is going to be managing your calories in and calories out, being in a calorie deficit. And then the second two support you in being able to do that. And that is we manage the hurdles that are particular to this stage of life. So many hurdles that we're facing at this time. We think about all of the possible menopausal symptoms, you know, um, joint pain and fatigue and low in energy and seasonal allergies and hot flashes. I mean, the list goes on and on. You're well aware about these, right? So we manage those. And we also think about just this stage of life as in where we're at in um, our lives, as in we have aging parents and we have teenagers we're dealing with and we're, you know, we're doing really well in our career. And so there's this time crunch, this middle age squeeze. So we work on managing that to help us keep our calories in, calories out where they need to be. And then the last part is what I'm talking about here right now, which is ditching the long held beliefs we have about weight loss that aren't serving us, such as it's my age or it's my hormones. If you do those things, you can and will be successful. I wanna introduce you to somebody. This is Marnie. Marnie was a member of my Fitter After 40 program this past fall, and I love what she says here. I have to move, I have to move this little box where you and I are, Amanda, I can't read it. In my 58th year on the planet, I felt like I'd lost autonomy over my body, that the effects of menopause were burdens written in my DNA. I'd been piling up a mountain of excuses as to why I should continue eating a big self-soothing bag of potato chips every night and wear maternity yoga pants every day forever. In our first coaching call, you talked about believing I was capable of changing my habits. Then and there, I decided to trust you until I could trust myself. Over the past nine weeks, I have shed self-doubt along with 14 inches and 16 pounds. That's a lot to shed in nine weeks, you know, 16 pounds, 14 inches. But let's let's really think about the fact that she said self shed self doubt that she could actually do this. And you can pretty do it. Too. Pretty there, powerful. Pretty powerful. It, it is. There's zero reason you can't lose weight over 40. Zero. So let's talk about autonomy before yeah. we move on to mistake number two, because I think that that's something that a lot of um, women don't truly think is. Um, achievable. So autonomy meaning the idea that you have control of your choices of what you do in life. And when it comes to diets, we're often forced down a path of restriction or rules. And those rules and restrictions make you lose all autonomy. The, the idea is when you want to, if you're looking at weight loss or to just support your health, understanding how nutrition can be a part of that um, with education and then allowing you to make choices is literally the most empowering way you can lose weight and then maintain a weight that suits you. Absolutely. That, um, that autonomy, that idea, like I am making a choice today to do these things is something that's going to be able to help you be successful long-term with weight loss versus feeling like it's something being done to you. Like you're a victim. Like I have to do this. I have to follow this plan or I have to go to my workout. My coach says, I have to do this. You know, it's always your choice every single day. And frankly, one day you might make a different choice than you made the day before. And that's all good. All right. Mistake number two. You think, because you're constantly told, that you need to cut out carbs to lose weight and be in shape after 40. All right, drop into the comments and tell me which of these have you been told. Number one, refined carbs equal weight gain. Number two, carbs at night equal weight gain. And number three, low carb equals faster weight loss. Drop in and tell me, Amanda, which of these have you heard? All of them, all, all of, them. of them. And um, number one is definitely something that gets vilified, refined carbs. And I'm sure you're going to expand on that to be about the hyperpalatable foods. Um, carbs, like what you eat over when you eat is something that is, there's some validity to it, but clearly when you eat isn't as important as what you eat. Um, and definitely the low carb crowd. I mean, that's, that's um, yeah, you can lose weight on low carbs, but guess what? You can lose weight on high carbs too. Hello, all the Asian population. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> we, we hear this all the time. And so um, all of them, all of them, all of them, all three, all of them, one and three. Yeah, one, yeah. And, three, one, one and three most commonly. Um, but yeah, 
these yeah. are just um, ideas that are pervasive when it comes to nutrition. And, and I would, all, and I, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just, I was just going to say, I would say because of that, that's usually if you're following a diet that follows one of those three rules, it's because the diet is being built around those rules. That's all I would say about that. It's true. It helps sell their message. Yes. Yes. And I'm, and we're going to talk in a minute. I'm not saying a low carb diet can't work because it can. Uh, for all the headlines about the benefits and what for people over 40, we are told so often is a necessity, must do low carb to lose weight. Research does not support the claims that low fat is superior for fat loss or that carbs make you fat, even nighttime carbs. Okay, so what does the research indicate? It indicates that when calories and protein were equated, both lower carb and lower fat diets work equally as well for fat loss. So those two words I have there in yellow are the most important. You have to have your total calories under control and you have to be eating enough protein. If you do those two things, you can adjust the amounts of carbs and fats in your diet to meet what you prefer, what you feel best eating. Really important here to note um, that low carb, I'm not saying is worse than low fat. You can absolutely do it. What I would say is to question is, does it fit with your lifestyle? Do you enjoy a lifestyle of low carb? For many people, it just doesn't work well because we like to eat bread and that's a part of what we do. It's part of how we eat. For other people, they're really happy just not having that stuff. And that's a okay. Low fat also works. The other thing that a lot of people don't think about is when you are in perimenopause, what are a couple of the symptoms that we deal with a lot? Brain fog and fatigue, right? When you're eating low carb, what are two things that you typically can feel? Brain fog and fatigue. <laughs> and so this can be a recipe for disaster for a woman in perimenopause. It can really exacerbate that. I'm just so tired um, and I'm not thinking clearly kind of feeling. And so again, you as an individual can evaluate how does this work in your life? If you prefer low carb, but you just don't feel great on it, that might be a time to make a switch. Thoughts there, Amanda? Yeah, so exactly. Um, carbohydrates are broken down into its um, basic form as a glucose, which is our main energy source. Um, and especially if you're an athletic woman or you know anyone that exercises, you want the carbohydrates to be one of the in instant fuel sources that your body goes to. In addition to that, the protein and the leucine part of the protein, one of the finer um, amino acids that breaks down, helps with the cognitive aspect. It crosses the, the blood brain barrier and it can be really helpful. So these two are actually just helpful things to focus on in um, menopause to just help maybe lessen some of the burden of the symptoms. Absolutely. Now, the research I was talking about there, it's not specific to women over 40, but we can see women all around us who've lost weight eating carbs over 40. I did. The pictures I showed, showed you of my transformation, I did not go low carb. Here are a couple of ladies who've done my program. This over on the left, this is Sydney. She was in her 40s. She ate carbs during this transformation. This is Vanessa on the right in her early 50s also ate carbs during her transformation. We can see evidence of this all the time. If you're hearing must eat low carb over 40 to lose weight, it's just, it's not the case. It's not supported by research and it's not supported when we just look practically around us. So what does this mean for you? Back to what I said, first of all, in our last point, you gotta keep your total calories in check. Number two, eat adequate protein. And then within those parameters, choose whichever ratio of carbs and fats you prefer. Whatever helps you adhere to your diet is going to be a good choice for you. And I would say to question if in your mind, you think like, you know what, when I did keto or when I did low carb, like I lost a lot of weight. So that worked for me. I want to go back to it. But if when you do that, when you eventually reintroduce carbs, you gain all the weight back, I would say to question, is it really working for you? Okay. This is Carol. Carol was a spring 2021 alum of Fitter After 40. She spent a lot of time at the ballpark. And Carol says, as a baseball mom, I included French fries, hamburgers, and hot dogs into my eight-week plan, and I still saw results. Carol lost over 12 inches and 15 pounds. Super important to note when she's talking about like fries and burgers and hot dogs here, she's not talking about a hamburger like wrapped in a piece of lettuce. She's not talking about hot dogs like wrapped in a jicama wrap or French fries made out of cauliflower. Like these were the real deal things, and she was still able to see results. 
we do want to manage the total amount of hyper palatable foods in our diet, right? So if we're having a consistent diet that, that is French fries and cookies every single day, we're going to struggle to keep our calories in check because these foods are literally designed to make you eat more of them. And so what we do is we reduce the total percentage of our diet that includes these things. So can you sprinkle these across your week? Absolutely. The ratio I like to look at is 80-20. So 80% 80 of our food comes from nutrient-dense, minimally processed foods, and the other 20% we can get from these more fun foods, French fries, hamburgers, hot dogs, cookies, those kinds of things. And that can really help us keep the total number of calories down and keep the nutrient density of our diets up. Thoughts on that, Amanda? As, as human beings, if we start omitting foods that we like, foods that we enjoy, the cycle of our system will be that we'll, we'll want them more and inevitably you may binge on them. And, it, and sometimes we see that in diets where we're really good all week and then we like relapse on the weekend because we've had these rigid rules. Whereas if we know that we can have these fun kept carbs, as I like to call them, and we've planned for them and we know that they're coming, um, it means that you can still eat the foods that you enjoy. And, and essentially, if we want to have any longevity in our nutrition, it has to include things that we like. Full stop. Even sugar? <gasps> even sugar. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've been following Amanda's sugar gate issue over on Instagram. She had the audacity to say we can include sugar in our diet. I had the audacity to say that sugar isn't addictive. And uh, people tried to pull me down on this, but the research backs that it isn't, but it, we do like it and it does elicit a dopamine response. And we do um, get that from lots of things you know, having sex, doing some exercise, like dopamine is good. Um, sugar isn't addictive though, but we can plan for it. And the idea of changing our behavior and our attitude towards like eating sugar, which tends not to be sugar, but more of these hyper palatable foods. So yes. a combination of fats and sugars and salts. Yes. Um, yeah, we can manage those in our diet. You don't know, need to go sugar-free at all. And you as an individual will need to figure out what works best for you. For some people, it's really challenging to um, maintain a good weight of re good rate of weight loss with hyper palatable foods in the house. It's yeah. really it's habitual to eat them. So if you have a package of Oreos in the house, you just keep eating Oreos. And for other people, they can have it around and be okay with it. What I would say is that over time, anybody can practice having those foods in the house during a weight loss phase when you've been somebody who's um, overindulged in those foods for many, many years, a good practice is to keep them out for the time being and practice eating them in small amounts when you leave your home. And so let's say you typically overeat Reese cups, instead of having that bag of fun size Reese cups in the cupboard that you're constantly going back to and overeating, plan into your um, weekly meals that you're gonna go out to the gas station and get a pack of Reese cups once or twice a week, okay? And then it's portion controlled because if you go out and you buy one pack and bring it home, you literally can't overeat it because you don't have more. And then over time, you can work on being the person who can bring the Reese cups back and put them in the cupboard. It takes practice. And I would okay. just add to the practice side of things that um, inevitably these things don't just take a week or two they take months and months of practice and often Absolutely. women will go about you know looking at their nutrition in this standpoint and go but it's not working for me I've tried for two weeks three weeks and it's not working and you've got to be in this for the long game if you want sustainable change well that's going to take a lot of time and so that's all I would say for anything anything that's new in your life like just keep the it's the stickability how can you stick at this long term? Because that's how you're going to see, you know, real change. Yeah. Both the um, how fast can I lose weight takes longer than people think. Think as in, you know, we're really um, in our society, we really think that weight loss equals, you know, a good rate of weight loss is like two pounds a week or even a pound a week. When in reality, half a pound to two pounds a week is really good progress. So if you don't have a ton of weight to lose, so if you're like, I want to lose five, 10, 15, 20, 25 pounds, even 30 pounds, half a pound a week is incredible progress. You could feel discouraged if you're expecting one to two pounds and you're getting half a pound when in reality, you're making incredible progress. So in that way, um, this all takes a long time and takes practice and also changing our habits. 
takes a long time. Um, it is not a quick two week thing to all of a sudden be the person who gets up in the morning and goes for a walk first thing. That's not a quick change to make um, till that feels natural and easy. It's not a quick change to make to be the person who has vegetables with dinner and lunch every day. If you, that's not your go-to, it wasn't mine. I didn't start eating vegetables till I was in my forties. I'm not making that up. I did not eat vegetables till I was in my forties and I had to practice eating them because I didn't like them. Um, and that was not a quick, easy overnight thing for me. So all of this takes time. Don't get discouraged quickly is what I'm saying. All right, mistake number three, our last mistake here. You believe that cardio is the key to weight loss and building your best body. All right, which of these resonates? Which of these feels like you? Number one, you're a cardio queen. You love to cardio. You use your workouts to burn as many calories as possible. Give me a one in the comments if that's you. Number two, you hear that cardio is the way to your goal body weight and you freaking hate cardio. And you're just like, I don't, I don't want to do it. <laughs> or number three, you have no idea what to do in the gym. You're like, I don't know. What should I do? Let me know. Tell this me what you're saying. This is going to be really interesting to see because I have preconceived ideas of what women think. So I'm interested to see. <laughs> so, so far, we've got one, one of each. So <laughs> that's, that's yeah. really interesting. Um, I think um, we're drawn to being cardio bunnies as women. I think we like the feeling of it. If, if we found the, you know, that type of cardio, we like, oh, here we go. Blah, 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 blah. I love yeah. cardio, but not for weight loss. None of the above. My cardio is to lift weights faster. Car is my girl, because obviously that would be my answer too. <laughs> and somebody that. said number four, I have a good idea of what to do, but no motivation. Oh, that's a whole oh. other, that's oh. a whole other um, presentation. Yeah. Absolutely. Lynn, Lynn says sure. she loves cycling and swimming, but not for weight loss. She does weights. Also, we've got a really good handle on this, maybe in this group. We have yeah, a I'm really excited addicted to, to cardio, they said. I'm really excited to hear that, ladies. Cardio, amazing for your heart health, amazing for your mood. It's important for our longevity. And for some, it's just plain fun. Like they really, really enjoy it. Cardio, though, is not the best tool in your toolbox for getting lean, toned, and defined. In fact, no form of exercise is your main tool for fat loss. Now, maybe in this group, people are a little more educated because you've been following Amanda around what actually works for um, exercise and fat loss. A lot of times people's knee-jerk reaction is they have the thought, I want to lose weight, and they immediately, I'm going for a run. I want to lose weight getting on the elliptical. That's kind of our knee-jerk reaction in society. In fact, no form of exercise is your main tool for fat loss. Who can drop into the comments and tell me, what do you think is your main tool for fat loss? It's not a quiz. You're not gonna fail the class if you don't get it, but I bet somebody knows. I'm almost certain that this um, group knows, um, like I said, they're, they're pretty educated women. I'm gonna give them a chance to actually type the um, information in. Um, but yeah, I mean, like you, like you say, like the, there's a preconceived idea. And I think maybe outside of this group, there is uh, the idea that maybe from old school bodybuilding, you know, that we need to do an hour extra cardio a day. People are here, calorie in, calorie, calorie out, sleep, nutrition, calories, um, calorie deficit, strength training, um, abs are made in the kitchen, strength training. So we've got strength training and calories as the two amazing, consistent. Amazing. So yeah. look, I love strength training. I'm really, we're going to get that into that in just one second, but even strength training, not your main tool for fat loss, always and forever. Your main tool for fat loss is going to be your nutrition above any form of movement you can do. Here I have the fat loss hierarchy made this pretty purpley pink triangle for you. If you look at the bottom part, the largest part here, when we're talking about what works for fat loss, protein and calories. So that's where we should spend the bulk of our time. If you're a person struggling to lose weight and you're really focused on how should I be exercising and you're not spending as much time thinking about what can I do to get my total calories under control? How can I increase my protein? You've got the balance flipped. So protein and calories, most important. Above that, we see these two forms of movement. We've got strength training and NEAT. If you don't know what NEAT is, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Sleep and stress, I heard somebody say that. And then here at the top, this little tiny bit is cardio. And remember, this is specific to fat loss. This is not just, cardio is not good for anything, but when it comes to fat loss, cardio is at the tippy top here. The analogy I like to give here is imagine you just had a big snowstorm 
people have been getting snowstorms all kinds of places, like even South Carolina had snow this last weekend, right? Imagine you have a big snowstorm, your driveway is covered in snow, lots of snow. You've got to go out and you've got to haul that snow out of there. You and personally are going to go out there and remove the snow. You've got a couple of different tools you can choose. You can drive a plow, you can use a snow blower, you can use a shovel, or you can grab a teaspoon from the kitchen drawer. What are you going to choose? You're going to get the plow, right? Maybe, maybe the snow blower. You're going to get one of the big tools. Choosing cardio when your goal is fat loss is like choosing the teaspoon. You're not getting very far. You're going to put in a whole lot of energy. You're going to be like, wow, this is, this is a lot of work, but you're not going to get the results that you want from it. Okay, so what is the role of exercise in fat loss? Let's talk about strength training first. Strength training with progressive overload. And what I say, when I say progressive overload, what I mean is doing more work over time by adding weight, sets, or reps. Just because you're holding weights and doing a workout does not mean it is strength training with progressive overload. There's a lot of classes out there, group fitness, that it's cardio with weights in your hands. Nothing wrong with that, but it's still not strength training. So when you're strength training with progressive overload, it can help you preserve your muscle and even build muscle in a calorie deficit. And that is one of the biggest roles that strength training plays when it comes to fat loss. The calories determine whether you're going to lose weight. The strength training can help determine that what you lose is fat, not muscle. Super important, we don't want you losing your muscle. Amanda, you look like you're gonna say something. <laughs> I, well, I think that I think that just I'm, I'm just agreeing and I just would add to that that um if your goal isn't weight loss and it's body composition well this is where the magic happens in the weight training forum like so if you're really happy with the weight you are but just want to just improve your um overall health and then change your shape it's magic that's where the the strength training can really help and and also you're working your if you're working hard in a strength training session that's cardio there's very very few times that I do a strength training class and I'm not in this anaerobic threshold like to the point where I can't breathe and so yeah you get in your cardio and then if that's really important to you you're improving your your overall heart health and uh this idea you're talking about about changing your body composition strength training is such a secret weapon for that I don't know if you ladies have had the experience of doing a kind of weight loss diet where you, you lost a lot of weight and you didn't strength train and you got to the end. I, I had this happen and you got to the end and you like look in the mirror and you're like, that's not what I, this is supposed to look like. Like, where are my nice shapely arms? Like, why don't I look like Linda Hamilton from Terminator? Like what happened here? I was so disappointed in my forties. I did Nutrisystem and I lost a whole bunch of weight and I was so confused. I'm like, I don't have shapely arms. Where are my muscles? Well, I hadn't built my muscles. I had lost weight. And in doing that, because I hadn't been strength training or keeping my protein up, not only had I lost fat, I had actually lost muscle, not built muscle. And so looking fit is going to be fat loss if you have excess fat to lose, and it's going to be building muscle in either case. Okay, now in this setting, where we are women in perimenopause, we're women 40 and up, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the health benefits of strength training. Okay. I know this, this chat is about weight loss, but this is just too important to ignore. I want to share a couple statistics with you and I'm not trying to like super scare you, but I do want to scare you just a little tiny bit because it's so important and you have so much that you can do to prevent what these statistics are saying can happen. First statistic here, these couple of statistics are from the International Osteoporosis Foundation. Worldwide, one in three women over the age of 50 will experience a fracture due to osteoporosis one in three. That is a whole lot of women. Now this next stat just like blows my mind. A 50 year old woman's risk of death related to hip fracture during her remaining lifetime is equal to her risk of death from breast cancer. Okay. I'm a 51 year old woman. Do you know how much more I had thought about breast cancer than hip fractures and osteoporosis? Like we all think about breast cancer more, right? It's what everybody's talking about. Well, we need to be thinking and talking about our bone health. Something to say about that, Amanda? Yeah, um, after speaking to Dr. Avram Blooming, he um, confirmed that on average every year in the USA, 40,000 women will die as a result of um, breaking their hip from complications. 
Um, and that's usually typically older women, like ladies over 60, whereas the total number of deaths from breast cancer is lower and it's all women. So, you know, it's even it's even more like um, minute the, uh, or acute, I should say, the, the problem. And, um, and, and the fact is as well, you know, if you start doing stuff to improve um, osteoporosis, well, you can reverse it. We can build bone as we get older. Um, just, but just in generally improving your muscul musculoskeletal system is good for so many other systems in the body as well. Absolutely. So, anyway. Absolutely. And then let's talk about our muscles here. After the age of 30, you begin to lose as much as three to 5% of your muscle mass per decade, unless you're doing something about it. And for both of these things, both sarcopenia, which is that muscle loss due to age and osteoporosis, which is the weakening of our bones, both of those things can be prevented and improved upon by strength training with progressive overload. Incredibly important tool that you have available to you. And it's the same tool that I'm telling you is going to help you look better. So if your goal is like, Hey, I really want to look better in my clothes. It's the same tool that's going to actually help you age better and age healthier. So win, win there to strength training. Okay. Anything else you want to say about strength training before we move on, Amanda? Yeah, totally. <laughs> There's so much. It's like, I'm obviously a little bit of a, like a hardcore a strength proponent but like for those women who are struggling with hot flashes just the um couple of studies that came out one from dr roseanne woods in the usa and one from scandinavia that showed that we can improve our vasomotor motor symptoms by up to 70 percent so all you ladies with hot flashes cold flashes night sweats and you don't strength train it's something that is accessible to you and it, you may see improvements in those symptoms so for sure like why not also yeah. depression, anxiety, there's so many subsystems that this strength training can improve that um, literally nobody goes into a strength session and comes out afterwards feeling worse. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's people don't really think about um, the benefits as far as like anxiety and depression, as far as strength training, often we'll hear about it more in terms of cardio, like those endorphins we get going, but absolutely there has been research to support the idea that strength training can help with symptom, uh, symptoms of anxiety and depression. And now we're talking about even with the vasomotor symptoms. So, so many benefits waiting on the other side of you becoming um, consistent with strength training. Okay. So let's talk about NEAT. NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. This is all the calories your body does uses doing activities like cleaning the house, shopping at the Target, walking up the steps to go to the bathroom, sitting here twirling my hair or bouncing my leg, walking my puppy, um, all those kinds of things. All the calories your body uses doing anything outside of structured exercise, that's NEAT. Now, it is going to be more impactful on your calorie bottom line than cardio. That might surprise you, but if you think about it for just a second in terms of just a day, let's say you're super hardcore cardio and you do an hour a day every day, that's one hour. And let's say you get really good sleep. That'd be amazing for you. I hope it for you. And <laughs> you get eight hours of sleep a night. That's nine hours. Okay, there's still 15 hours left in a day. So just the time available to increase the amount you are moving throughout your day, there's just more time to play with there. So we think about how can we get ourselves moving more? Can we talk on the phone? Uh, can we pace while we're talking on the phone? Can we... Um, and Amanda made fun of me for doing this last year. She told me I was making tea all wrong. But when I make tea and I boil my pot of water uh, while my water is boiling, I was walking around my house and I was like, I'm getting hundreds of steps around waiting for the two or three minutes for the pot of water to boil. Uh, so all these little ways we look, you know, parking farther away at the store, looking for ways across your day to increase how much you are moving can have an amazing benefit on your calorie bottom line. Thoughts on I that? Might, I might just say that it wasn't the steps that triggered me. It was the no. way you were making your tea. It was but, not the steps. She was fine with me getting steps and she just was horrified by how I make my tea. <laughs> Um, I, I really just love how much you've emphasized the neat part of it. I mean, I obviously talk about it a lot myself. And, and actually what Kim did um, when she was snowed in, it was really interesting. She did, she would phone me and do, be doing laps around the house and I was getting a bit of vertigo watching her. But you know what? Like it all counts and it really matters. And it's so good for your overall health as well. Absolutely. And it's one of those things that it's just not that hard. 
it can be hard to get in the habit of it, but it doesn't add that much more effort into your day and it can really have an impact on your calorie bottom line. Okay, I wanna be super clear about this. I am not saying cardio is bad and I'm not saying cardio is useless. Specifically here today, we're talking about cardio in terms of weight loss and there it's just not the big tool we make it out to be. The other issue is we have such a transactional approach to cardio and that can really negatively impact your relationship with food and exercise. What I mean by a transactional approach to cardio is that so often women think like this, I'm having pizza tonight, how many calories do I need to burn on this run? Uh, I just ate an Oreo and a chocolate chip cookie. Uh, how long do I need to get on this rower? I have to burn that off. And that kind of transactional approach to cardio is not going to help your, your thoughts, your feelings, your relationship with exercise and food and your body. The other thing is the math just is not on your side. When you're trying to use cardio to keep your calories in line, it's incredibly hard. So these kinds of step trackers, are amazing for tracking literally your steps. They're not great. What research shows us is these are not great for tracking your calories burned. The same way with the, the devices that are on your treadmill or your elliptical. Research has shown that these are all off by a substantial amount, some of them over 50% off. So if you think you're burning 500 calories, one, you're burning a lot less. And two, when we try to translate that into like an app and be like, okay, now I'm gonna take that off of how much we ate, we often end up, oh, out, oh, weird. I'm just totally having a brain fart here. We often end up out eating our deficit. We eat it right back up because of the fact that when we are tracking calories, it's all just estimating, right? There needs to be a buffer. And we eat that buffer back up when we're like, well, my step tracker says I burned X calories and we put that in. My best advice for this is to stop tracking your calories burned ignore it. I'm not saying don't do cardio. I'm saying don't do it with the idea of you're burning off the food you're eating and don't keep track of it in terms of calories burned. Amanda, what bravo, do you think about that? Bravo, bravo. Awesome. So let's wrap this up with exercise then. Bottom line recommendations for exercise for fat loss. Number one is to remember it is not your main tool for fat loss. That's your nutrition. Okay. Number two, strength train three to four times per week focusing on getting stronger over time. After that, move more. Upping your needs should be your priority. And then this last one I'm sliding in here is actually not about weight loss, but it's just super important. The physical activity guidelines for Americans, this is for your health, 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity or 75 minutes of vigorous activity per week. This is really important for your health. And that 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity, that could be your need. This could be you taking a walk each day or a couple of days a week that, that gets your heart rate up a little bit, okay? It's really important for our health to move that way. That's not about fat loss though. I do want to remember our bottom line here is the purpose of exercise is not just to burn calories. It can do so much more for you. We just talked about how it can help you improve how you age. It can improve your bone strength. It can improve uh, your um, muscles. It can improve your heart. It can help you with symptoms of anxiety and depression. Not only that, it can help you feel so much more confident. There is a lot that exercise can do. Let's stop thinking about it in terms of how many calories does it help me burn. I want to introduce you to Treva. Not only has Treva lost over 30 pounds in six months last year, she joined my program in the spring. From the spring to the fall, she went from being able to do absolutely zero pushups on her toes to being able to do 15 with just amazing form. What an incredible feeling that is to be a woman who's in middle age and be able to do that. Gosh, you guys remember for me and Amanda, I don't know how it was in the UK, but we had to do in the US, we had to do these, um, these presidential fitness tests every dang year. And they would make you get on the floor and like, see how many pushups you could do. Well, every year I could do zero. And I'm like, stop trying to make me do them. And they'd make us hang from the bar to see how many pull-ups we could do. And every year I could still do zero. I'm like, I'm just hanging from a bar looking like a moron. And it feels so empowering as a woman in my fifties to be able to bust out pull-ups and bust out push-ups. This is an amazing thing and has so much more impact on my life than how many calories did I burn in any particular exercise session. I mean, I think for, for the example of Treva, what I love about that is when I know Trevor, I've known her for years and she told me, oh, I'm so excited. I've bought a squat rack for my house. She's gone from yes. never doing strength training to doing 
barbell squats and deadlifts. Um, but the additional thing and the thing that I got from that slide is it's really important to, to like believe in yourself and believe in your athletic ability because we are capable. But that belief system gets squashed down a bit, potentially by all of the menopausal symptoms and just the thoughts in our head. And so I would just encourage women to just try something new and then just keep trying every day. And it doesn't have to be a push up. It doesn't have to be something physical, but the learning of new skills, the belief in yourself, it will really help you overcome that confidence. Absolutely. So ladies, you've had this slide up for a minute. I hope you had a chance to think about it. I want you to pop in the comments and tell us what is one thing you would do if you were exactly as fit as you want to be. I asked this question while, while I'm waiting to hear from you guys. I asked this question on my stories the other day. And uh, one of the people who responded is one of my fall uh, 2021 alum. Her name is Paula. And she's like, Kim, I'm doing it. I'm doing it tomorrow. I start, she started strength training for the first time ever in the fall. And she's like, I feel ready. I feel strong enough. I feel confident enough. I'm going skiing for the first time in seven years tomorrow. And I was super excited for her. So tell me, ladies, what is one thing you would do if you were exactly as fit as you want to be? I'm just bringing this back up because it just went off. So for me, what I would like my thing, if I was as fit, as I feel fit, but if I was as strong enough, it would be pull-ups because yeah. it's always my thing. Like I can do two or three. I want to be able to do like Linda Hamilton pull-ups. Uh, <laughs> we have some, we have some great uh, comments here. Um, I would like to be able to move without pain. I believe that exercise actually has an entry point for everyone, and but it should never hurt. And so there's definitely ways to be able to sort of accommodate that. Um, Robin made that comment. Hike through the Grand Canyon. Actually, Kim can talk about that. Do an ultra marathon. I'm already fit. I just need to wrap my brain about my around my change in body composition. And I haven't conquered pull-ups though. Yeah, me and you too, Jackie. That's fine. We can do it. We can definitely do it. Talk yeah. about the Grand Canyon, because that was a big hurdle for you, Ken. Yeah, it was. It was especially, um, so this past September, I hiked the Grand Canyon from rim to rim in one day. So it's over 24 miles from the top of the North Rim all the way down across the bottom and back up the other side. It was especially a victory for me because just like Amanda, I had long haul COVID last year. I was on bed rest for many months and I'm still, I'm still not hundred percent from that, but in my recovery from that, I worked on, go I couldn't even walk a park that I used to walk all the time. I couldn't make it around without sitting multiple times. And that's where I was in the spring. And by the fall, I was hiking the Grand Canyon rim to rim. So big victory for me there. I have a couple of others to add to this. Um, I'd like to walk on the beach without becoming winded. Mm. I'd like to do a full set of push-ups on my toes and a pull-up. And I'd like to be able to get out of my wheelchair and walk with my crutches again. Oh gosh, those are so amazing. And for those of you who are like, I just want to be able to walk without being winded. And I just want to be able to move without pain. There is a place for you in the gym. There is, there is exercise that can help you. It should meet you where you are. There is zero reason we can't get you moving without being in pain and get you moving without being winded for sure. I want to share something with you ladies here. This is Joanne. She's a spring 2021 alum of Fitter After 40. And her story really illustrates an important point. She says, I have found confidence that goes beyond the gym. While addressing a serious and prolonged medical condition, I was able to clearly advocate for myself to receive appropriate medical care. I am far more capable than I previously knew. When you get stronger in the gym and you see yourself being able to do things physically, it really does bleed in, over into your confidence in all areas of your life. And this is a great example that she was able to speak up and advocate for herself when she knew that previously she would not have been that person. Um, that's a huge, huge win. Okay, so let's go over these three simple changes we've talked about here today and wrap these all up. Number one, question that voice in your head telling you that you can't lose weight because of your age or menopause. That voice is wrong. Number two, instead of fearing carbs, keep your total calories in check, keep your protein high, and then experiment with what works for you in terms of carbs and fats, okay? Basically, you use the calories that are left over uh, after you've gotten enough protein in and you see well, how much carbs, how much fats, what do I prefer? Let's get rid of the fear. 
And then number three, you're gonna swap that focus on cardio for calorie burn to focus on strength training and upping your NEAT. That is what works for fat loss. Thoughts on any of that, Amanda? Okay, no, this is great. I've really um, enjoyed this, just trying to simplify the complicated and give um, actionable things that women who are listening today can um, really do. And um, it's just such a pragmatic, practical approach. I mean, it's one that obviously I take two of the words why we're so aligned. Um, I think we've probably got time for a little, a little Q&A at the end. So I'm going to ask people to do absolutely. Some, um, Comments me, whatever questions I already have, have. A, I already have a couple, so I'll I'll give them to you now. We can discuss them, and people continue to put them in. Let's just do five minutes or so on that. Um, so, where can people get resources for strength training? So, a couple of things. One, um, Amanda's book, amazing. She has ooh, a nice strength ooh, training room. Oh, it, tomorrow it's ninety nine cents on there you Kindle. Ninety nine cents there tomorrow on, on um, Kindle. Second. Uh, I would love to have you. I'm going to invite you to, to check out my Fitter After 40 program. I just opened the doors yesterday. Doors are going to be open until next Wednesday. It is an eight-week program. I work very closely with all the women in there. It has eight modules that take you from where you are now. You know, today you've learned a lot of really important information to help simplify fat loss. The problem becomes when we just gather information, we can't make changes by just learning things. We have to make changes by implementing them. If you want help actually implementing the things that I've taught you here today, join me in Fitter After 40. We will spend eight weeks working on the nutrition, exercise, and mindset strategies you need to actually make progress. Amanda's gonna give you a link to the program later, but in that program, I give you a full six week strength training program, and I give you all the resources you need to learn whether you've never done a squat in your life or whether you're barbell back squatting, I will meet you where you are. Okay. If you can't move without pain right now, I will meet you where you are. It is very adaptable to what you know and what you can currently do. I've popped the um, link in the chat at the moment. When I do awesome. go to post this video, um, I will put it in the description because I don't know how it's going to save. Um, Perfect. So yeah, so um, two questions that you can answer approximately because it's very individual. I'd like you to sort of explain to people, like, how do they know what calories and what protein they should be aiming for every day if this is something you want to try on their own? Yeah. And there's a bunch of information that will go into giving you. The first thing I want you to know is no matter what method you use to figure out your calories and your protein, it's always an estimate. There's no, I don't want anybody to continue hunting for the number. Nobody has a specific number. We're looking for a range and you'll be able to judge whether it's working based on results after you've been consistent with the numbers you've had for a while. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick guide, but there's more to it that goes into this, but you could start here. For protein, think about multiplying either your current weight, if you don't have a ton of weight to lose, like if you just have a little bit of weight to lose, your current weight, if you have a substantial amount to lose, think about a goal body weight for you, multiply with those numbers by 0.72 and by one, and that's a good range for protein for a day. So start there for your protein. For your calories, we have to think a, a, a couple of things again, whether you have a lot of weight to lose or a smaller amount of weight to lose. And then again, if you have less weight to lose, you can use your current body weight. If you have more weight to lose, we'd have you choose a goal body weight. So some number less than you weigh now. And we'd have you multiply that by either 10, 11, or 12. And this is going to be depending on how active you are. And when I say active, I don't just mean like I work out four times a week. I really mean, think about what you do in a day if you go to the gym three or four times a week, but you sit at a desk the rest of the day and you don't go out and move, you'd probably be closer to a 10 or 11. If you're, um, you know, you're, if you track your steps and you're getting in seven, eight, nine, 10,000 steps a day, you might be up there at a 12. Um, so multiply 10, 11, or 12 times your body weight or times the goal body weight, and that'll give you a starting point for your calories. Right. I think we might leave it there um, because it has gone on for an hour and I know that's a long yeah. time to keep people engaged. Um, I'd just like to thank Kim for coming along today. Um, um, I'm going to be posting this to YouTube and I will also post this into um, the Facebook group again. So come back later and you can review this. And um, 
yeah and then if there's any more questions then reach out to us you know later so thank you so much kim absolutely it's always good to be here with you amanda thank you to everyone for joining today and again if there's any questions you can pop them in the comments when i post this either on youtube or on facebook and we will get back to you as soon as soon as we we see them all right thanks, thanks everyone bye thank you bye bye